Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? Why does the establishment fear change? Tonight, sometimes you have to rock the boat to keep it from sinking. Barack Obama ran for president in 2008 on a simple but deceptive message of hope and change. What his campaign lacked in substance, it made up for in style. In that way, the idea of hope and the promise of change were not concrete proposals by candidate Obama, but facades propped up to allow voters to graft onto candidate Obama their own hopes and aspirations. So the anti-war youth voted for candidate Obama, expecting an anti-war president. The militant left voted for candidate Obama, expecting a president who would take from the rich and give to the poor. Independents voted for candidate Obama, expecting a post-partisanship presidency. Even libertarians voted for candidate Obama, expecting a president who would defend personal freedoms. Needless to say, President Obama did not fulfill the promises of candidate Obama. Why? Because each Obama supporter had his own unique idea of what candidate Obama's message of hope and change actually meant. And since candidate Obama's message was murky and malleable, there was hope that each supporter's personal idea of change would be implemented. The campaign was a brilliant fraud. When Americans voted Barack Obama into office in 2008, they did not vote for massive change. They voted for a message tailored to make them think that they were voting for exactly the change that each voter wanted. If Barack Obama had run an intellectually honest campaign on substantive changes and reform, he wouldn't have won. For the same reason that because Ron Paul is campaigning on substantive change and profound reform, the establishment says he can't win. Here's the dirty little secret about change in government. Nobody in power actually likes change. That's why the profound truism about change is that the more things change, the more, they, the more they stay the same. Because change is so hard and so slow and faces so much opposition from those in power. At the outset of the Revolutionary War, no more than a third of the colonists actually supported revolution. Now that doesn't mean that the other two thirds thought that British rule was good for them or even better than the alternative. All it meant was that those two thirds didn't want to rock the boat even as the imperial boot pressed harder down on their throats. If it weren't for a small slither of American colonists who were revolutionaries, considered at that time to be radical and out of touch and dangerous, and who were willing to rock the boat, we'd all still be part of the British Empire. Even among the revolutionaries, the idea of change was not unequivocally embraced. Alexander Hamilton and his big government faction actually wanted George Washington to become a king. So some of them were trying to recreate here in America exactly what they had rejected from Britain. Why? Because change scares people in power. They cannot imagine their lives without the power. Today, the tides of change are stronger than they've been in a generation. The establishment is doing anything it takes to stem those tides. That didn't happen four years ago with Barack Obama. At the beginning of his presidential campaign, he had to fight the Clinton machine. But at some point, he won that machine over and the Democratic establishment embraced him because Barack Obama never really represented a threat to the establishment. Three years into his fight whatever war he wants, kill whatever American he wants, give away whatever cash he wants, regulate whatever behavior he wants regime, we know that Barack Obama represents business as usual for the establishment. Compare that to Ron Paul. Even if Ron Paul won every primary from South Carolina tomorrow to the New Jersey and California primaries in June, he wouldn't be embraced by the establishment because no candidate since Ronald Reagan has so threatened the establishment. Remember what the establishment said about Reagan? He's radical and out of touch and dangerous. It's the same thing the establishment now says about Ron Paul. What's so dangerous about him? He wants a return to the Constitution. And though the Constitution is our founding document and embodies our first principles of limited government, sound money, and personal freedom, we've drifted so far from it that a return to those principles would indeed mean substantive change to the government. The only danger Ron Paul represents is to the establishment that fears its own loss of power. It's a sad state of affairs that a simple return to first principles represents fundamental change. But that's where we are today in 2012. It has taken nearly 250 years to stray as far from founding principles as we have. 
If we want to return to them in our generation, we're going to have to rock the boat. We've drifted so far, drowned so deep in debt, lost so many of our rights, fought so many fruitless wars, that if we don't rock the boat now, we may end up sinking with it.